Euromax Highlights. And here's your host, Robin Merrill. And a warm welcome from Berlin. Coming up on the show... Design Dreamer, the wild creations of Belgian fashion pioneer Walter von Beerendonk. Motor Music, a symphony in which cars are used as instruments. And Design Destination, we're off to Finland for the Helsinki Design Week. Ludwig van Beethoven is one of Germany's best known and most loved composers and naturally the city of Bonn in North Rhine-Westphalia where he was born is very proud of its most famous son. So much so that it honours him with an annual festival. Every year in September, music lovers from all over the globe gather in the city on the Rhine to celebrate the great composer's music. This year, the Beethoven Festival has more than 60 concerts and features some of the top names in international classical music. French pianist Hélène Grimaud is just one of the big names at this year's Beethoven Festival. Together with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, led by Austrian Manfred Honeck, she is performing Ludwig van Beethoven's Piano Concerto No. 4. Beethoven's fourth piano concerto, it's part of my DNA somehow. Uh, it's always been my favorite of the five. It's the most, how say, different. Of course, they're all different, but it's the most unusual, it's the most original, the most touching, I find, the most lyrical, the most poetic. It's become something of a tradition to have live public viewings at a central square of concert highlights at the festival. It's not just a consolation for those unable to get their hands on tickets. The public viewings are a popular way to come together and enjoy music in the open air. The weather is good, the music is beautiful. If you live in Bonn, you know Beethoven, and it's just great to be here. It's great that you can bring the whole family and that you can sit outside and it's free. It's fantastic, especially with weather like this. I was here last year and it rained the whole time, but we still stuck it out with our umbrellas and watched it all anyway. Bonn is Beethoven's birthplace and home also to Germany's international broadcaster Deutsche Welle. DW is also media partner of the Beethoven Festival and happy to put on the annual public viewings. This is a bit of marketing for the international broadcaster. We've built up quite a good fan base here. The public viewing is being staged for the fourth time. It's also an opportunity to bring the Beethoven Festival, which can accommodate only a limited audience in the Beethoven Halle, to a lot more people in the city and region as a whole. The Beethoven Halle on the banks of the Rhine is at the heart of the festival. This is where most concerts, especially the bigger ones, take place. The opening concert on Friday featured one of the world's top violinists, Anna-Sophie Mutter. Anna-Sophie Mutter played Felix Mendelssohn Bartholdi's famous violin concerto in E-flat. She was also accompanied by the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra under Manfred Hunek. I feel at home at the Beethoven Festival. It's part of my past, my present, and hopefully my future too. This is a festival with very high artistic standards, and it's great to find an audience that's grown over the years and decades.
Stars are the icing on the cake. That's how I see it. So naturally, I was very happy that we could engage Anna Sophie Mutter for this year's opening. Hélène Grimaud also appreciates the special nature of the Beethoven Festival in Bonn. The care that uh, that everyone is is putting into this uh, this programming, the hospitality, um, the level of the working conditions, it's really outstanding. And then, I mean, the public is just just lovely. The Beethoven Festival 2011 in Bonn got off to an impressive start. Visitors and locals alike can now look forward to four weeks of musical highlights. Wonderful music in a beautiful setting. And from Bonn, it's just a short hop to our next location in neighbouring Belgium, where they're also quite proud of Walter von Beerendonk, the celebrated fashion designer and artist. He's actually the maverick of the Belgium fashion scene and became famous for his spectacular fashion shows in Paris back in the 1990s. Right now, the Antwerp Fashion Museum is presenting the first large-scale retrospective of his work, and the man himself showed us round. As far as the Belgian designer is concerned, fashion is not fashion unless it's crazy, whimsical and deeply imaginative. In the world of clothes, Walter von Berendonck is often seen as an enfant terrible. My way of working is very narrative, so I really like to tell stories. And that from, from day one, it was very clear that, that I, I wanted to, to, to work with collections which were telling something. There are more than 450 pieces on display at Walter von Berendonck's first retrospective exhibition. Although there are massive differences in terms of style, each piece stirs the senses. This is in fact the, my fascination for the spiritual, but also for alien and for... And this was, um, collection was called Welcome Little Stranger. I found it also very nice to welcome strangers in general. Many of his collections have a cultural theme. Among his best-known work are the costumes worn by U2 on their 1990s Pop Mart tour. His career path is as unconventional as his designs. It began after graduation when he and some friends from the Antwerp Fashion Academy decided to show the world what they could do. The group, which included Dries van Noten and Anne de Meulemeester, was intent on making an international splash. We literally uh, took, hired a van and we went uh, to, to London to show our work there. And uh, it was a very practical decision and, and, uh, and now it looked almost like a, a big plan, but it was just like, let's do it, let's go there, let's rent fa uh, six stands and, uh, and be together on the, on the fair. The group became known as the Antwerp Six and gave Belgian fashion not just one, but half a dozen names. Collectively, they put Antwerp on the fashion design map. Dries van Noten and Anne de Meulemeester are now also major players in the industry. Van Berendonck's fashion shows are legendary. He's received many awards for his art and is seen as the craziest of the six. He's very um, uh, unique for Walt that he really questions the boundaries of menswear, uh, mixing elements of female uh, wardrobe with a male wardrobe and seeing how far can I go until something becomes female. He's extremely professional in his approach and rarely works less than 10 hours a day. Van Berendonck designs three collections a year. For me, anything can be an inspiration. And, and from that, that's also the way I'm thinking. I, I'm very open-minded. I, I want to experience a lot of things. And, and then I, I, it all gets into my head and in my books. And then I start to, to, to sketch it. And then I start to, to imagine how it could be. So in fact, everything is happening in my fantasy. And then I just put it on paper and I just make it. 
However extravagant his creations, Van Berendonck considers himself a designer for every man. At the end, I'm really concerned about the product because it's also part of my thing. It's not that I'm making art. It's, I'm, I feel like a fashion designer and also want to make a product which can be worn. He says his designs are not as crazy as is often claimed, but visitors to the exhibition can make up their own minds about that until February 2012. We continue with the unique celebration of the automobile in the southern German city of Mannheim. There's been lots of events going on there this year, as it is where Karl Benz patented the first car 125 years ago. I think we can safely say he would have been astounded by the spectacular musical tribute to his invention commissioned by the city. It included a full symphony orchestra, a choir, a laser light show, and some rather special percussion instruments not normally seen on a concert stage. 250 instrumentalists and choral singers with Johannes Harnight conducting. British Platz in the middle of Mannheim has been turned into a 360-degree panorama stage. In the Auto Symphonic, a very special piece of music, cars set the tone. Automobiles are orchestra members at this world premiere. In visual art, this is old hat. Just think of Andy Warhol. He painted soup cans and dollar bills. No one thought they could become art objects as soon as they hit the canvas. Now it's about a symphony, not a picture. A car is caught in a symphony, or vice versa. The symphony gets in a car and drives somewhere. This combination is the new idea. Auto Symphonic is a work by the Cypriot composer Mario Sianu Ilia. I didn't want to just depict the car as a machine with noises. My ambition was to raise these noises to a high quality level of sound, in harmony with the rest of the material I used. The performance uses many different makes and models from automotive history. The oldest car here is 125 years old. The most expensive is valued at 350,000 euros. All the cars are on loan from private collectors. At first it was difficult to get through to the owners so that they'd like the idea of me testing out their cars. Because as you've seen, we don't caress the car, but try to press the juice out of it from all sides. One of the stars of the evening is the very first car with an internal combustion engine. German engineer Karl Friedrich Benz developed it in Mannheim and patented it as Benz patent car number one in 1886. It was the moment the automobile was born. The composer, Mario Sianu Ilia, is not interested in the historical or commercial value of the cars. For two years, in 120 cars, he sought the sounds he could use in his music. It's fascinating to make music with everyday objects. You have to persuade people that vehicles, although not instruments, can make good music and be played at a very high level. This is another avenue of access to music, a common object used to sensitize people. You have an object used every day, but you don't consciously perceive it. My goal was to raise the object to a higher level. An audience of about 17,000 was on hand in Mannheim on Saturday when Auto Symphonic was performed for the first and only time. I thought it was fantastic. The laser show, the music, the cars, simply unique. 
It was amazing. What else can I say? It was very, very good. The set was simply wonderful. Auto Symphonic celebrates 125 years of automotive history. The musical message? The automobile itself needs to be reinvented again and again. And shutting the car door will never sound the same again. Finnish design has an international reputation. That's why the annual Design Week in Helsinki is a meeting place for interested parties from around the globe. Indeed, the International Association of Industrial Designers has named Helsinki Design Capital of the World 2012. Experts say that design is an integral part of daily life in Finland. So we went along to find out more. Helsinki is often described as one of the world's most livable capital cities. One factor may well be that so many things in public spaces, like the trams, are carefully designed to meet human needs. Even the public waste containers were designed by an agency commissioned for the job. It was Hanu Kahunen's agency. His concept of design for everyone has helped to shape everyday life in Finland and made him famous throughout the country. In public surroundings, things should be uh, should work for uh, uh, in point of view of, of all users, and uh, design for all means that uh, things are designed for children, for elderly people, for disabled people, and and of course. Uh, uh, those who, who can act normally in an environment. His company is three decades old. The design process involves meticulous research to identify the demands made on the end product. The first thing design has to do is work. Public design is also on the agenda at the annual Helsinki Design Week, a top event for the country's designers. Some 30,000 visitors are expected this year. Design critic Kai Kalin is one of the organizers. Design has always been a very important part of our national self-consciousness, especially after the Second World War. But then uh, from the, the early 90s, something happened. Helsinki changed, and we, we discovered the Helsinki lifestyle. And this meant baby boomers, young families, and opening up. One of the reasons why Helsinki is the 2012 world design capital. A whole district is dedicated to the theme of design and is home to more than 200 design galleries and shops. Young designer Johan Olen runs a shop in the heart of the city. He and his partner have won prestigious awards for their work. Typical Finnish design is functional, but Johan Olen adds a playful touch. These are called the dancing shoes. They are made for a father and daughter or uh, a mom and a son. It's, uh, we produce this in, uh, in the middle of Finland, in the middle of nowhere, called, in a place called Jansa, where they have long traditions of making felt shoes. And this project that we are visiting here now, it's quite firmly based in, in Finland in the traditions that we have, maybe not so... Well, they, they go hand in hand, but mainly the manufacturing traditions, what we have. Olin will soon be among the exhibitors at the London Design Festival. He's following in the tradition of Finnish success stories. Like Marameko, which has enjoyed international renown for decades. The foundation was laid by designer Alvar Aalto in the 1930s when he created classics such as the Paimio chair and the Aalto vase. Eero Arnio's ball chair, designed in the 1960s, captured the decade's free-spirited zeitgeist. Even now, Finnish design is a byword for functionality and simplicity. Traditionally, it's also linked to nature. And recycling. This product, designed by Kahanen, was a fruit crate, then a chair, and now it's firewood. The design, which is as a style long-lasting, it, uh, it, uh, you, uh, you don't have to change your uh, furniture or tableware every second year. You, can, you, you are satisfied with the aesthetics. And uh, it's, I think it's, it's the most important statement what designer can do. 
Helsinki Design Week is becoming more international, but the younger generation isn't forgetting its roots. They are becoming rapidly very local. And uh, the, the old cliche is, I uh, think, globally, act locally. In Finland, design is an integral part of daily life. Now, this country, Germany, can, as we heard earlier, lay claim to being the birthplace of the automobile. And certainly some of the best-known brands in the world are made here. It also has one of the leading automotive trade fairs, the International Motor Show, that has just opened in Frankfurt. Right now, more than 1,000 exhibitors from all over the world are presenting their latest models and innovations to an eager public. Now, while the car industry here is in good shape, the idea that the car is the number one status symbol is waning. So, what's taken its place? For years, the auto industry could count on one thing, that Germans love their cars. They polished them and cared for them and drove them about proudly. Today, this is no longer the case. It's definitely a big status symbol. Some need a car, some don't. If I need one, I borrow it, and then I don't care what it is and what it looks like. The main thing is that it works. People from outside looking at you, uh, a car also has um, uh, is a part of your image, sadly enough. When you consider the environmental damage it does, it's better to do without a car. Progenium, a management consulting firm in Munich, researched what Germans think about the car as status symbol. Porsche was rated as the most popular car, but cars are losing popularity in comparison with other consumer goods. High quality clothing and expensive vacations have become more important over the past few years. For many people, the car has lost importance as a status symbol. For young people and those in big cities, it's been replaced by things like an iPhone, a good mountain bike, a vacation on the Seychelles, or a new designer kitchen. The car may be losing importance as a status symbol as it faces more and more competition. But those questioned distinguished clearly among different makes. While Germany's premium car makers like Porsche and Mercedes-Benz still carry prestige, the majority of autos get mediocre ratings. We see an increasingly differentiated two-class society. On the one hand, the customers of the German premium car manufacturers, especially Porsche, but also Mercedes, BMW and Audi, who still have a strong emotional response to these vehicles. And at the same time, more and more people want a more functional product to get from one place to another. They don't care who makes the car. The fascination of the Porsche. Entrepreneur Dietmar Strohal has been a Porsche fan since his childhood. The 58-year-old regards it as the status symbol par excellence. For me, it's really a different kind of driving. In the company I keep, there are an awful lot of people who love cars. So it earns you a certain amount of respect. The study shows that middle to high earners tend to associate cars with status more than any other social grouping. Women and young people tend to prefer status-neutral compacts or to do without a car altogether. Like David Buroff, the 28-year-old simply rents a car when he needs one. A car isn't important to me at all because I really only use a car to get from one point to another. And I don't define myself by means of a car. I never have. I'd rather invest my money in something else that I enjoy more. Experts say the car is losing its social importance, but not its importance as an individual means of transportation. Manufacturers face some big changes. The power of a motor is becoming ever less important, but building up a positive brand identity is more significant. The auto industry has missed the boat. It's short on innovative designs and innovative development, especially in the area of sustainability and ecologically sound vehicles. People are becoming more and more aware of the damage we cause with individual mobility. Customer priorities are driving car makers to develop a greener status symbol 
Manufacturers are beginning to respond with innovations like an electric sports car. Well, I still think it will remain a status symbol, especially for men. Anyway, that's all we've got time for on this edition. Until next time, from myself and all the crew here in Berlin, bye-bye.